Welcome to today's presentation, everyone. I'm here with John McDougall. John, welcome. Welcome, Byron. Thank you. Very excited about today's presentation. Let me go over a couple of rules for today's um, webinar, our 50th, getting close to my age, very close to my age, which is the good news. <laughs> Congratulations um, on both. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Today's webinar is really going to focus um, on agency life and content marketing agency life specifically and uh, we're going to try to dive into some of the challenges with selling content marketing services and um, I'm very excited to share some experiences I've had with Ideal Launch which was a full service content marketing agency and um, a couple of house rules for everyone. First, please ask some questions using the live chat. Second, use uh, the use tweet, uh, Twitter rather. Feel free to tweet myself or John uh, with any feedback on the presentation. That'd be really helpful and appreciative. Um, next, say, feel free to send me an email with any feedback or request for more information. Uh, know that we will be sending a link out after this presentation to everyone that will include a recording, it will include access to sl uh, download the slides that you're about to see. We also have a proposal sample which I've included which everyone will want to get a copy of as well as an actual content plan sample which I think everyone will find quite interesting and um, John McDougall of McDougall Interactive has put together a guide as well that he wants to give out to everybody. So lots of really cool stuff that everyone's going to have a chance to take a look at. So without further ado, I'm going to start the presentation and dive you into my quick understanding followed by John uh, on this topic. So I want to talk a little bit about the pitch and, and how to really sell content marketing services. Over the years I've done hundreds of pitches and uh, at, at our peak we had about 100 clients uh, that we were doing business with including Walmart, the Comedy Store, Brookstone, FTD, lots of really interesting companies on the BDC side as well as B2B companies like Iron Mountain, Salesforce. We were blessed with some great clients that trusted us to help them uh, and grow their business organically the content marketing way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the pitch today, the workflow, um, and the results which really drive more, more pitches and more workflows. It's kind of a circular world, if you will. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's dive into the pitch. So I'm a big fan of the Socratic approach in, in selling anything. And um, I believe um, wholeheartedly that no one really wants to be sold to these days. I try to teach and train any sales reps that have ever worked for me to stop selling and start asking questions to really learn the wants and needs of customers. To me, that's the driving force of any sale. And when I hear people starting to talk about their features and their business and their services and how great they are, I put a big caution flag up because it's conveying to me that they care more about what they're selling than what my needs are. So use your judgment and develop your own tact and strategy. But I made crystal clear to any people that were selling for me or myself when I was selling that the Socratic techniques work, not only with trying to sell, but also in uh, managing your customers. And by the way, my slide deck is kind of interesting today. I've actually chosen to write out sort of what I'm saying so when you download this deck, you'll have a quick summary of what I'm talking about. So I'm sort of trying a new technique here. So uh, let's, let's see how it works. Feel free to give me feedback on that. So I wanted to actually show you all some smart questions. You can take a look at these while I'm, while I'm talking here. But <clears throat> when you're selling content marketing services, you've really got to ask very, very good questions to understand what your, what your target audience, namely your customers, needs are and how sophisticated they are in the buy cycle of content services. By asking these questions, it's quite remarkable how much you can learn and how you can really size your, your customer up with what their needs are and whether you, your services match those needs. I'd also point to some of the bottom questions here. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tools you need as well to, to find uh, the clues as to what, what, how the customer's performing, so I'll talk about that in a second. Another thing to really hone in on these days is, is your client's understanding and respect for the content marketing revolution that's happening. <clears throat> and that 
is very revealing, I think, in the end of the day, with how difficult it's going to be for you to sell them content marketing services. I like saying this line, I've said it to a thousand people, a hundred, this is my classic line. The definition to me of content marketing is forward-thinking companies are starting to think like old-school publishers, gathering ideas, developing stories, publishing a steady stream of content that engages their readers and keeps them coming back for more. <clears throat> I can recite that line off the top of my head, and I often begin discussions with, with anybody about content marketing to make sure that we're on the same page with, with that understanding. And I think there's, there, you know, back when I was selling content marketing, back in 2006, 7, 8, 9, you know, content marketing was, a, especially content marketing agencies, was a relatively new concept. And, you know, from the C level, uh, you know, downward, people were not buying into it as, as, a, as, as a, a viable way to invest. Pay-per-click was much more appealing. You could actually track your visitors, your conversion rates, whereas content was more subjective and more difficult to produce and get buy-in from multiple people, um, and in general, a more difficult concept to sell. But I think when you, when you find those customers that are drinking the Kool-Aid, if you will, you have a remarkable match, and it's, and it's worthy of, of seizing that opportunity very quickly. So what does the match look like? What is the match made in heaven? I think it's an important question to ask. And, you know, from my perspective, you have to look at both sides of the table here. You know, the best clients, you know, come to the table with a sense of urgency. They know what they want. They're, they're, they're crystal clear on what the objectives will be, particularly with performance. And most importantly, a client will have respect for your skill and your ability to deliver. And really all of those things are the clues that you need to quickly understand as you're prospecting and looking for customers. You can waste a lot of time out there with clients that are not the right fit and don't have the appreciation for what you do and don't really know what they want yet. That's the real challenge I think we're all facing. Um, and likewise, you know, the best agencies know how to dive into the client's business and surface with a plan to deliver the creative ideas and content necessary to make stuff happen. Uh, more importantly, they have a proven track record to back it up. And, you know, that's my quick take on the matchmaking process and one I think you should hone in on to really make your pitch work pitching to the right people at the right time to really maximize your return on, on your own time in pitching business. So the homework before the pitch <clears throat> is really pretty critical. You need to learn quickly <clears throat> how their site is performing, who the competition is, which of course you can ask them. You might be surprised when you ask them, by the way. Um, you know, what's the keyword focus? You know, what's their social cloud? What's their current publishing frequency? You know, what, what are the content goals? What kind of quality is the client looking for? What kind of quality do they have right now? You need to do your homework before you even engage in a conversation with a customer. This is key, it's critical, and it begins to put you in the right kind of position to understand what their needs are and dive much deeper than just what's your budget, okay, what are your goals. You need to get much, much deeper than that. So you'll be left with those. So <clears throat> a lot of cool tools out there. Let me show them to you. So. You, uh, you have the key research tools, which I think everyone's using. And by the way, this is just my quick list. Remember, I'm not doing full service content marketing service at all anymore. So we, we moved completely out of that business. We're, we're now in a, in a platform working with agencies, working with clients to use our platform and to have content created. So. The tools that I was using, particularly these research, research tools that you see are, are, I'm sure everybody's pretty aware of all of these, but you'll have a list for you. There's some interesting workflow tools as well. Um, and I wonder how many people on the line right now are showcasing these tools and using these tools in their presentations and their pitches. When I was out pitching content, we built our own tool called Word Vision. You can go to wordvision.com and check it out if you want, but the net of it is it was our go-to demonstration tool where we showed clients how we were going to deliver the ROI that they were demanding. And 
without that tool, I really don't believe that we could be successful. Now, this tool or vision was not HubSpot. It was not the incredible tools that are there right now uh, that are out in the marketplace. It was a, a precursor to some of these incredible tools that were built, but it was essential. So I wonder who on the line right now is, is using tools. I'd love some feedback on that, some comments to then share with some of the other agencies. What are your go-to tools? What are you using? Love, love to hear that. So one of the challenges that we all face is, you know, what is the definition of quality content? How do we define that? And let's face it, it's subjective, right? So the key, however, when you're selling content services is to quickly understand the expectations a client has with, you know, with their content and what is quality content in their eyes. And what that means is you need to ask your customers for samples of excellence to try to set the bar. And you need to review all of the specifications they're going to have and the requirements really before you even get to the proposal stage. I mean, you've got to understand what this customer wants if you're going to start to imagine what it's going to cost you to produce it, either in-house in terms of time, research, um, or other variables. Or you know, out outsource as well. Is it a three-star work? Is it five-star work? Is it premium work in our in our world over at Writer Access? And even on the premium level, is it ten cents per word? Is it a dollar per word? These are tremendous price variables that you need to contemplate when you talk about this reality that you get what you pay for. So that needs to be thought through. Next, let's take a look at the proposal. And I've actually super fun good news for you. I actually have a sample proposal that I created like five years ago, so please excuse the antiquated uh, aspect of it, but I'll try to show that to you as I move along. But you're going to be able to download a proposal, and what I would have you think very carefully about is, you know, you've done some research, you've sized up, you know, what it's going to take to deliver the ROI the customer demands. Now it's time in the negotiation stage to really size up not just a single proposal um, that works within their budget, which we all you know, want to try to do, but instead try to showcase some different levels of service and solutions that will likely deliver different results. And those are key uh, distinguishers, at least they were for us, because we could put together a few different proposals very quickly, they would start to predict what kind of ROI measurement. And I think it's worth you taking a look at the way we set up our proposals and templates so you can get a feel for it. And if you want a sneak peek, if anybody's dying right this second to, to download the proposal, you can go here. I actually set up a page that will allow you to download this um, so you can you can take a take a quick look at that. So <clears throat> another very interesting aspect of the way that I used to pitch business was to sort of dive deeply into learning what, who's going to do what. <clears throat> and <clears throat> you might be quite surprised to learn, and I'm sure you have, that <clears throat> customers have a very different understanding of, of who's going to do what. For example, who's going to handle idea, idea creation for blog posts? Is that going to be the customer? Is that going to be you? <clears throat> the answers to those questions are very key, particularly with who's going to be approving the content, what skills do those people have that are going to be approving the content, what's the expected turnaround time, you know, how far in advance do we need to plan, you know, what's the sign-off process look like. You've really got to get a deep understanding of who does what if you're going to be profitable on these projects and campaigns that you're bringing in. And there is a lot of variation, I can assure you, with expectations and who does what. It's a few questions for you to think about. So the, one of the challenges, how do you show your strengths? So, you know, in the end of the day, it's really how you bake the cake, not the ingredients of the cake. And that's a very important metaphor. I wrote a nice blog post about that some time ago. But the net of it is, you know, while we may think that our you know, long list of assets that we've created is essential and our expertise is essential. I would argue, you know, that it's really how you pitch your whole approach to content marketing that needs to be your distinguishing characteristic. 
you need to tailor make your approach to every individual customer as well. It's not a one size fit all campaign. And I would suggest that it's sometimes, you know, a bit more analytics here or uh, more emphasis on optimization, you know, reviewing what their current link popularity is and maybe infusing uh, link popularity. You need to customize your entire approach to content marketing for the specific needs that, number one, the client's telling you they want, number two, what you're seeing with what, what they're doing currently. So your strength is not just a laundry list of what you do, your strength is ability to customize what you're delivering to your customer. So the real muscle behind the pitch in my mind is your references and you know hard to believe perhaps but you know while you may dazzle your prospects with the scientific approach and a glitzy proposal that seems to work sometimes and smooth talking rap you know what really matters is references particularly at the agency level um, you know obviously you know it's difficult to get good references. It's it's often taxing, at least on you and your customers, to imagine your customers selling your services. We always had great difficulty and resistance almost with you know having to go to clients saying, "Hey, could you offer a reference to me?" But unfortunately, when you're out pitching, you know, monthly retainers, and, you know, and or fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollar plus projects, or even better yet, we were pitching half a million dollar projects fairly regularly. You know, your references play a big role in building trust. And that, there's some creative ways that that's being done right now. You know, video testimonials are quite interesting. At least that's a, a one-up situation where a customer then doesn't have to, uh, you know, make phone calls on your behalf. Um, I think we're, we're using technology intelligently these days. LinkedIn, another great place for references uh, that are private and can be done on a one out. But that really does become the muscle behind your pitch and an essential element. So let's now go to the workflow and, and buzz through this a little bit quicker. So to me, content marketing is a team support and your team plays a really key role in, in that whole process. You know, who's going to run day-to-day -day contact with customers versus creation and idea, you know, ideation of topic ideas versus optimization, you know, versus distribution. You know, these are separate people often that are responsible for these that all need to work together. Um, and your team is a key asset to success. Um, and I would argue that you also need outside team players to help out. But the question is, how are you managing those? Most of the agencies we work with at Writer Access have one dedicated person uh, that manages maybe 50 or 100 customers on a very large level, but they're the key person using the Writer Access platform every day. They're entering the orders and the ideas for orders, or they're asking our writers to pitch ideas to them. They're approving the content. You know, as we scale up agencies, um, you know, we we're seeing this sort of team effort really be centralized by one person who sort of becomes go-to, particularly for the content creation and optimization side of the coin, servicing a wide variety of customers, particularly if you're getting the help from outside platforms like Writer Access. Um, but you know, what does the content flow look like as well, um, and how does it go from drafts to approval to publishing? That's a key component that agencies need to think through. And what's the experience required for each of these team members? If you're going to build an A team to deliver A results and get you know, A reviews from your customers, what do the skill sets look like? And where are people getting these skills? You know, training somebody to be a content marketing specialist or a content strategist is really hard to do. Um, you know, people need a balance these days of, you know, working with massive amounts of freelancers and they also need help with strategizing more at the agency level. Um, they also need help, you know, experience working on the client side of the table, you know, and they're just, not a lot of people have that well-rounded experience that really understand how the whole workflow works. Keep that in mind as you think, think it through. So, um, I mentioned a little a second ago this concept of, of the captain of the ship, and I'll just come back to that real quick. But I do think you need a point person that understands that's sort of a know-it-all in, in in the particular industry. Um, we've seen a lot of our agencies, you know, focus on particular segments. That makes a lot of sense. 
um, and I think you're, you can build your team members around those expertise if you're really going to make the workflow work. Um, and that really all needs to come together if, if it's if it's gonna uh, if you're gonna be able to make it work. So the next fun thing I have for everybody is is an actual content plan. Um, I may choose depending on our time frame and how many questions we get in the end. Um, if people really want to see an actual content plan, you're gonna be able to download it and take a look at it. But if you want me to talk you through it, um, then just request a, a question about it perhaps. But the net of it is content plans really are the secret to success and they answer you know four or five main questions namely how much content do we need how frequently do we, do we need to publish it how good does it need to be what distribution channels do we need and what return will I get for this investment your content plan should really be answering those questions including and especially the last one which is what ROI should I get for this investment and again you're going to be able to get a sample of this to take a look at it um, which you'll get there. Well, I'll go back for a second. If somebody's anxious to make a quick download, have at it. Writeraccess.com forward slash content dash plan dash template. All right, so onboarding writers. So some of the secrets of onboarding writers, let's say you're using, you have in-house writers or, or onboarding writers, I would argue that onboarding writers is a critical element to success, particularly for the higher end pieces where a client may have an expectation level as we described earlier. So as it turns out, you know, educating and aligning writers is actually hard to do. You know, you need to test different writers that will bring different tones and styles and approaches to the content creation process to the table. You need to, you know, not put lipstick on a pig here if a writer cannot meet the expectations, particularly after one or two rounds of revisions and still not getting a silver bullet, then you need to you know, put up the the red flag and say, you know, I'm sorry, you're not right for this project. This is going to be too difficult to execute. One of the beauties of a platform like ours, obviously, is you've got the next writer instantly lined up that wants to see if their skills and approach can can match up. So, you know, test writers, make it work, put them to the test. That's really what you need to do. So obviously the challenge is to get the words out and the traffic in and you, you, you clearly need a steady stream of content to achieve that goal. But the, you know, the battles require, you know, some battles require a lot of content, like for example, trying to achieve top listings in the search engines for keywords that have a high, you know, complexity to them or a high pay-per-click price, high search volume. You know, it, it's, it's hard to jump from, you know, from not even on the in the top 100 to a top listing at Google, so you know you need to choose your battles wisely and be and, and look closely, particularly if if it's traffic gains in the search engines that are part of the goals. What are the expectations? You know how can you get the words out? How can you get the traffic in? You need to get extremely granular and look at some of the challenges that you're experiencing, including new websites, you know, the competitive keywords, you know, maybe it's a re-optimization process, maybe the client has low link popularity, you know, all of these things need to come in, you know, but if your focus and your job is to get the words out and the traffic in, you need to, you know, divine a, a pretty clear solution with a client in the planning, in the workflow stages to really make key decisions on what to go after and, and how much traffic you think you can bring in. So um, optimizing for multiple channels, also key factor here. Um, you know, some of the tricks of the trade um, I'm going to talk about throughout this presentation in a second, but you know, I would like to argue that optimization is the new SEO. <clears throat> you know, you need to optimize for multiple channels, not just, you know, scattering and peppering keywords into content and optimization, you know, the days of fooling the search engines are over. It's now about great content written by great writers that have authority with things like Google Plus, that where you have attribution with these writers, which you can now get on Writer Access, for example. Um, and you need to know who these writers are and what they're doing, and you need a multi-channel distribution. You know, that means on-page optimization, uh, a more personalized approach to the content itself, uh, maybe s sprinkling in some inbound links and some A-B testing. Um, you know, in other words, multiple channels, multiple optimization within each of those channels. And if you do it, you'll win, they'll lose, namely the competition. So how do you get the word out and what's the strategy there? So, you know, 
what's really happening with the distribution channels these days is we're starting to zero in on lower user acquisition cost on different channels. And that's really where you need to uh, get you know, as much expertise as you can and as much experimentation budget as you can with the customers that you're working with, clients, uh, because you just don't know what, what's going to perform until you give it a try. And that makes it extremely difficult to, you know, map out a budget for a customer, you know, when you don't know what's going to work yet, you know. And so you need to work around that complexity and look for flexibility with your customers and almost approach each client with, look, we don't know what's going to work yet. We don't know what's going to be engaging. We don't know where your customers are going to engage with us in the least expensive way, namely defining user acquisition costs. So the only way to do that is to get the words out and to see what works and to test and experiment with different channels until you find the lower user acquisition cost, in which case you then throttle up and do more. So we have all heard of the automated new machine that's coming at us, um, you know, Pardot, Marketa. Um, we're getting better and better at, you know, learning the uh, what works and what doesn't work, who's engaging, who isn't, who should we be calling, who shouldn't we be. And, you know, to try to think that you can drive a content marketing strategy for a customer and not have that data is probably fairly ridiculous, particularly if you're pitching bigger budgets. So, you know, use it and don't abuse it and don't let it completely drive, you know, the quality of the content or where you're publishing. Let it be loose, let it be granular, but let it deliver the results that it needs to, particularly with things like email automation and other, you know, things like that that are easy to set up and, and have, are clearly proven to, uh, to, to work. So I think the big thing that everyone on the line needs to hear is that while we're all diving deeply into content marketing as a, as a serious, you know, industry and practice, I think few people are true idea ideation shops, if you will. Um, in my opinion, you know, the agencies that have the big ideas are going to get paid the big bucks, to make a long story short. Um, you know, ideation is the bottleneck for most of the clients that we speak with that are not just looking, you know, you need that steady stream of content, no question about it. But for your signature pieces, your pieces you're looking for engagement, you're looking to get passed around, those those take a strategy, they take thinking, they take ideation, and I think that that is what is, is, is the fuel for viral marketing, uh, the innovation that you're seeing from Super Bowl ads to, uh, you know, viral marketing campaigns. Ideation will be the driver, and you need to dedicate specific meetings with your customers about ideation, and if you're not doing that, you're, you're in trouble. So a few tricks and treats uh, for, for everybody here with, with the workflow. I'll list them for you really quickly so you can, you can take a look at them. So, so what we've learned is there, um, we now have a, a, a search engine inside of, inside of Writer Access that quickly finds um, popular keyword uh, phrases that all start with popular search phrases that all start with how, what, when, where, and why. If we have more time, I'll show that to you. But it's a gold mine for finding what information people are looking for. I think that needs to be a driver in everyone. You can find these search engines out there. Uh, we, we have one that I think you might, you can try for free just by getting a free account of Writer Access and then going into Content Planner, which is now available for all of our customers for free. Click on, you know, idea, um, add an idea to, to the calendar and boom, you'll see this engine that will give you incredible stats and data and show you exactly what people are searching for related to these these questions. The other trick of the trade that I love telling people is, you know, if you're having a blog post created, someone's creating a blog post, their their head is right in the content. Have them also create, you know, a tweet and a and a Facebook post and a frequently asked question that that asset answers, and then list the s, you know, then distribute those out obviously to Twitter, and Facebook, and a special FAQ page you build on your customer's website that then links over to that post or that article. Um, we're finding, you know, 
when you start taking advantage of the opportunity to have um, to take one asset but have instantly multiple distribution channels and have them all linking and working to support one another, that's when you create a winner and that's what good strategists are doing within their workflow. So some other tips are, you know, finding stories or, you know, interesting things about the employees of company. You know, a lot of people complain that, you know, they, they can't seem to get their, their staff members to blog. You know, well, of course they're not going to blog. They're not writers. You know, they're, they're, they have other roles in the company. But they all have stories, and I think good agencies are finding those stories and documenting those stories and publishing those stories about the employees within the company. Um, you know, rolling up articles into an ebook or even a printed book is a simple idea. We've had customers, we've created, you know, 100, uh, 101 tips for that they've published on their blog that they roll up into an ebook or a, a printed book. I've done that myself. It's like that was, that was what I did when I first started my content marketing agency a while ago. Um, I wrote a book, 101 Content Marketing Tips. So um, I'm going to speed through and, and get through this a little quicker, but motivating writers are also a key factor here. Um, surprisingly, writers care more about just money. They need to be motivated. I think that's a key part to the content marketing sale, sales, motivating writers. Let's go through the results real quickly, and then I want to turn things over to John, because apparently I'm talking too slow today or something. I don't know what it is. Um, Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to just do something to my mic for a People are telling me that my mic is not good. Can you see your mic? Can you talk? Can you see? Can you something? Testing one, two, three. I just want to make sure I can. You're good to go. Hear myself? Okay. Good. There we go. I think I'm back now. Boom. Okay. Sorry about that. Ooh, that's buzz kill too. All right, I'll whip through this and get back down to where I was. Sorry, everybody. Glenn came in and screwed me up. All right. Glenn is great though. He helps me with these webinars. Appreciate it. All right. So with your workflow, let's go down to results super fast. So I think we left off right here, big off. So choose your battles wisely, another key part of all of this. Um, you know, I think that you need to use multiple reporting tools to find out what's working, what isn't working with, with your customers monthly, and reporting on different things and different victories. I think that's a key. Uh, you know, to like or to share is now the key question that most uh, of us need to focus on. You need to, you need to have traction in the social sphere to be relevant and you need to learn how to do that for your customers. Um, you know, show me the money. That's what customers really want to see. And I think you can do that in a variety of ways. And you should be doing that for all your customers. How is traffic affected? Listing positions. You can take a look at this later so I can quickly turn things over to John. Um, but I think I talked a little bit about the muscle behind the madness here, and that is namely your references. In my opinion, you need to ask your customers the key question. What is the likelihood that you'll recommend our agency to a friend or a colleague? There's a great book I highly recommend you take a look at called The Ultimate Question 2.0. And we're doing this now. We're learning who are our promoters. We're, we're reaching out to the people that are voting us, a 10 or a 9. We're learning that they're talking about us, they're referring people to us, and we're learning what they like about us so we can do more of that and less of what people don't want or our view is, is a negative part of it. I think agencies need to do that a lot more. It is the key to really where we all need to go. You know, we all know about analytics. We've got to look super deep to find where the success is. Um, and here, finally, so I can turn things over to John, um, this is sort of a, a quick reference to a new book that I wrote that I encourage everyone to take a look at. The real challenge is how do you price all this great content and what do you get when you pay more? Take a look at that book. Sorry I was a little slow today, everyone, uh, but uh, I hope this was helpful and I'll look forward to any feedback and any questions you might have. Without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to John. Hello, everyone. I'm John McDougall. As, as Byron said, I'm with McDougall Interactive Marketing. And I'm going to be talking today about the top 12 ways to be more strategic in your web marketing with a focus on content. 
So my my presentation is titled "The Web Marketing Road Trip." Can uh, Byron, you can see that on the screen? Yes, perfect. All right, all right, good. And so, <laughs> back in '94, uh, I was a media planner at my father's ad agency, which was the sixth largest agency in New England. And in '95, they gave me a laptop and said, "Go sell websites." And I would drive around with, uh, you know, a modem and a phone jack, and I would dial up in, in uh, companies' offices and show them the internet. And the crazy sound of the modem would happen, and you know, they called me a snakeskin oil salesman. And uh, one guy actually said, "This internet thing's not going anywhere," and kind of kicked me out. But uh, you know, we all know that uh, times have changed, and and the web uh, has really taken off, and uh, you know, all, all kinds of agencies are. Or um, you know, really, not only website focused but content marketing focused. But one thing that we see a lot, even with uh, our agency background and partnerships with other traditional um, advertising agencies, is that people often fall into the trap of being very tactical versus strategic. And so, in 18 years of doing nothing but SEO and digital marketing. I've never actually been given a client's traditional marketing plan uh, where they say, hey, you know, we're working with a traditional agency and uh, we'd really like you to keep on brand, on mission statement, and on point. Um, so I think the good news is um, number one on my list of 12 key things is um, if you can be more strategic in, you know, either selling content or in your web marketing in general. Um, you, you're going to be ahead of the next guy because we're amazed at how many people, um, you know, dive right into the details without setting a roadmap. And so my book, it, Web Marketing on All Cylinders, is about that concept of being more strategic in your web marketing. And you can see that on Amazon.com and all over the place and on, on McDougallInteractive.com. And so at number two, Surveying the landscape is critical, and Byron talked a lot about that in terms of using competitive analysis tools and just understanding also that marketing has changed. And back in the Mad Men days when my father, starting from 1969 or 1970 when he started the agency, um, you know, it was about reach and frequency. You know, how many people could you reach in a magazine? Uh, how many people would watch a TV ad, um, and how often could you could you get that message out there? But as we know, it's about engaging these days, and and uh, otherwise you're going to be blocked out. And so all the cylinders have to work together: strategy, SEO, social media, link building, absolutely critical. Uh, e e even despite the changes in Penguin, it's still a huge part of the Google algorithm. Um, content blogging, PR, email marketing, mobile, pay-per-click, analytics, and converting traffic, not just driving traffic. And so in the search results, unlike back in the early days in the 90s, um, you know, it was 10 blue text links that were what you got when you searched Yahoo or AOL, or then when Google came out, it was, you know, pretty plain, and these days, you have text links coming up, but local search, the map listings, video, images, tweet, uh, tweets from, you know, Twitter happening and Facebook and Pinterest and LinkedIn, all of these different social activities and different things are all popping up. So, as Byron was saying earlier, you know, you really have to address multiple channels. But with that said, being SEO focused all these years. We like to take an approach where your website is your core web presence. You could make Facebook your primary strategy, but um, in general, our clients will have a website usually with slash blog, so that it's yourwebsite.com slash blog, or if you really have to, blog dot you know blog dot your domain name dot com. We prefer slash blog so that your blog is on the core folder structure of your website. But either way, your website and the content on your blog is often 
at the center of all those other sharing activities on forums and um, Facebook and Twitter and, and all of that. So having a core web presence and really being clear what that is is important if you want to be more strategic so that when you're doing things on Facebook, you're linking back to the core web presence with a page that has a chance for Google to index on your main site and for people to link to on the main site. And so at number three, have a pit crew and not a webmaster. You know, the old days, people used to say, uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, you want to talk to the person in charge of our website, that'd be, you know, the IT person or the webmaster. And, you know, those days are gone. Um, it's just too complicated these days to leave your writing and your engaging content and your website and your conversion optimized graphic design for your website into the hands of one solo person that's supposed to somehow do everything well. Um, even, you know, writers, for example, we have one full-time writer here out of a dozen people in our, our boutique uh, internet marketing agency, and we don't ask that writer to do all of the writing for all of our clients. If we have 30 to 50 clients, and some of them are doing, you know, hip replacement lawsuits and others golf clubs, um, you know, it's, it's really hard for that one person to do all the writing. That's where, you know, something like writer's access, getting, having the ability to get writers that have specific experience in specific topics is an awesome way to augment your team so that people aren't wearing too many hats. And number four, Shareville, new data proves that SEO and social are part of the same zone. So page authority, the first bar on this list from, from Moz, is, you know, how, how important is your page based on who links to you, et cetera. Um, you know, that's still a very, you know, that's a, really what made Google Google was, you know, um, having an understanding of the other topically related important authoritative websites that link to you, and that's still paramount. And then Google Plus and a uh, number of linking group domains, Facebook shares, likes and comments, all of these things are part of what make your website rank in the search engine. So separating SEO and social media doesn't really work anymore. And both of them require really good content because nobody's going to link to you, um, you know, without, without good content. And so if you try and game it, you'll end up revealing uh, gaming social in, in, in this scenario. This is from Dwayne Forrester of Bing. Uh, from a webinar that I did that he ran, and he said, don't be tempted to game social media because on the left, it shows how they can look at the patterns of you, the growth of your social media. And so on the right is the more natural pattern of organically uh, created social media where, say, you have an amazing blog and the content is just so engaging that people are actually sharing it and talking about it and buzzing about it. When that really happens naturally, the search engines can see that. So gaming link building and gaming social, um, you know, really doesn't work anymore. And, you know, again, content will let you do it uh, more organically. And so SEO is now less and less about on-page optimization and more about social sharing and overall brand reputation online. You know, the, the basics of on-page optimization, they're still a prerequisite to ranking, but, um, you know, much less important than, you know, really standing out as an authority. And social and SEO are like bread and butter, so they go really well together. And the social signals, while they may not be proven to be, you know, immediately ca causing your ranks to go up, we know that a significant amount of social activity is common among the top ranked websites. So there's a high correlation between sites that not only have tons of pages, but quality enough pages where people are sharing those pages because it would be very unnatural from a search engine's perspective to look at your site and say, hey, that's great, you made 10,000 articles but if nobody shares those articles, something's fishy. 
And so because that's such a big trend for the search engines, Google and Facebook are battling it out on who is going to dominate the, you know, the, the, the realm of uh, owning social platforms. And so Google has a billion users a month on Google Search, YouTube, Google Maps, Android, Chrome, and uh, Google Plus not far behind. And so trust is also an important part of your strategy. And if you're trying to get people to you know, write about you in the New York Times and link to your website, it's critical that you have a hook and a blog and quality content. Otherwise, uh, even things like getting you know, listed, like we did, uh, we got a link from the New York Times on Thanksgiving Day last year. And it's because we had great content, I think, about uh, our seminar series. So tying the content into even things like public relations and, of course, your link building is a way, again, to think more strategic. And so while you're doing that, as, as Byron mentioned, Google Plus Author Rank, you, you want to not only have writers that are writing quality content, but to start to amass signals around those writers that um, can build a ranking, if you will, around the energy of those writers. So, for example, if you have a writer where you've put the Google author code on all of the 500 pages of your website, it might dissipate it a bit, whereas if, you know, you put the authorship code on the best articles on your blog, for example, and then you put that authorship code on some of your key money pages and Google sees that the high quality articles on your blog are linked to and written by this author and then that author also wrote some of your money pages, the, uh, the likelihood for those pages goes up in the search ranks because Google can see um, that author is important as opposed to just pumping out loads of content. And so people in search engines and journalists, they follow authorities and uh, authorities write. And someone like um, Susie Orman, just one example of a thought leader who has a book and a great blog and a ton of content, those are the people that are, are, uh, you know, that are pumping out all kinds of content, video, infographics, podcasts, white papers, blog posts, image galleries that I think are going to win, win the war by you know, covering all the channels. And content is proportionate to leads according to HubSpot. In fact, this shows that if you have 311 or more pages on your website, you have a 236% increase in the amount of leads. And you know, that's a limited number of people. Of course, it was, it was a pretty healthy survey that HubSpot did of their customers. You know, so 311 may be slightly arbitrary, but I think the idea is good that, you know, a 25 to 50 page site certainly isn't going to compete with, uh, you know, a larger site with volumes of healthy content. And so what we do, um, little, little mini versions of, of some of Byron's amazing content competitive analysis, we always like to look at least at the amount of pages indexed in Google such as for Bank of America, you know, 382,000 pages indexed, 452,000 links to their site with 10 million plus visitors. Uh, so if I'm working for a local bank and, you know, we, we've worked with about 10 or 12 banks uh, as SEO customers, um, you know, it's important to see not only what their local competitors are doing, but if you search Google for banks Framingham or credit unions you know, Boston, the, not only the local competitors, but the national competitors, even though our customer might say, hey, I'm not competing with Bank of America, well, that doesn't matter if they're beating you in the search results in Google for Banks Boston. So um, you're not necessarily going to get a local bank to compete size-wise with a 380,000 page website, but you do need to be aware that content is proportionate to um, monthly visitors to some degree. You know, Wells Fargo having less pages, uh, but certainly a lot of pages, 
129,000 pages indexed in Google, a blog with 15,000 pages, and 5 million plus monthly visitors, you know, you, you wouldn't see Wells Fargo having 25 or 50 or even 300 page website and then coming even close to those numbers. So we do um, competitive analysis using a site map and on our blog there's an article about this, how to, how to create a site map and do competitive content analysis. Um, so at the very least you can run a site map on your site and then run a site map on each of your top, say, three competitors, and then put those in tabs in Excel and sort by the type of file, like if it's a web page or a PDF, and then you can get, or a blog post, and then you can get a snapshot like this where you can say, hey, look, you know, our, our client with 895 pages is by far the smallest website out of all of these competitors, but interestingly, we have the most blog posts. So what are those competitors doing to get content on their site? So again, there's, there's a little bit of info on that on our blog, but, um, and Byron by far has uh, you know, amazing tools for that type of analysis. And then with competitive link analysis, it's really great to look at a competitor using a tool like Ahrefs, or Majestic SEO or Open Site Explorer by Moz to look at not only the amount of backlinks to a site, but what pages generate the most backlinks. So this is um, Stone Temple Consulting, and they have um, you know their blog and their interviews with Mac Cuts of Google. You know those are some of the types of content that get a lot of backlinks. So that's that's a really fun way to look at not only what's great content, but what generates a lot of backlinks. And so, of course, with the major algorithm changes, Panda, Penguin, and Hummingbird, you know, now it's all about quality content and quality backlinks and conversational content. Um, you know, people talking to their mobile phones and asking those who, what, when, and where, why questions, as, as Byron mentioned. And so, conversion optimization is so critical because for every $92 spent driving traffic, only $1 is spent converting traffic. But most people have, say, a 1% to 2% conversion rate. You know, for every 100 people that come to your website, if only one person takes an action, then you're leaving a lot of money on the table, especially when a site like Schwann's Food, uh, they have a 43% conversion rate. So don't be happy with 1% to 2%. And, uh, of course, if you... Um, you know, whether you're doing content marketing or even paid search, um, you know, I think increasing your conversion rate is going to increase the amount of leads you get even with the existing traffic you have. Um, but even if you're doing paid search and you're, you're really super focused on that, like we have one customer right now with almost 100000 a month paid search budget, but we told them we're not going to start the paid search until their blog is up to speed because we want to make sure that they're seen as thought leaders. So again, that ties it all in strategically so your content, even if you're, you know, your boss or your marketing people are trying to do a ton of paid search, it all ties together with being an authority. And then if you don't follow up well, um, you know, you're going to lose the lead. So responding within uh, five minutes Supposedly, according to InsideSales.com and a lot of other studies talking about this, leads to a 900% increase in conversations. Or responding to leads within an hour generates seven times the, the conversations, according to HubSpot. So, you know, it's one thing to create all this great content, but if you're driving people to your site and you don't get back to people for a couple of days, your competitor already got back to them and you lose the lead. So uh, mobile, of course, I think it's, it's probably fair to say, I would assume everyone's hearing how responsive design, even Google is uh, you know, making nice comments about responsive design. You know, if you're not optimizing your content for mobile, uh, you're, again, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. And then um, last few slides, just talking a little bit about uh, ROI tracking. So we always uh, do PowerPoint presentations for our customers every month, 
and one of the key slides from our analytics research shows which sources are driving traffic. You know, is your email content driving a lot of visitors like this customer? Organic traffic, people typing in your domain name, cost per click, uh, referral traffic, etc. And if you don't have attribution tracking set up, Google Analytics will look at the last 30 days of traffic in terms of did you know someone who came in originally from Facebook but later came in from a paid search click, you know, did that person coming from Facebook originally have an influence on why they clicked your paid ad? So HubSpot has a longer term uh, cookie based way to track attributions. So if you're doing really great with content on social and you want to know if it's affecting your overall strategy, just look into a tool for attribution tracking like HubSpot. And then takeaways, uh, create an internet marketing strategy document or plan before you just get moving down the tactics. And know that all the tactics feed on each other and are symbiotic with each other and that content and engagement strategy is, is truly a priority and engaging meaning don't just get the content out there but share it on social media and try and get influencers to retweet you, etc. And then conversion testing is critical versus just guessing that, hey, you know, we love the look of our new website, but what about the actual visitors? Did the conversion rate go up because you made you wrote better content or you added you added certain content to your blog? And then get serious about ROI tracking and don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, I just had a customer uh, who we had them ranked number one in Google for saxophones in about 2000 to maybe 2005. Number one for saxophones, a single word, and number one for band instruments. And he kind of dropped off working with us and put all his eggs in the eBay basket because it was you know, highly profitable. But now eBay kicked him off and his search traffic is in the tank and he doesn't have a good email list and he's just come back to us. but. It's going to be an uphill battle now because you know he had really kind of diverted all the energy into one channel, and it's a bit of a disaster. So um, having a multi-channel strategy is, is great. And so if you want, there is a uh, start to the long link here, um, but maybe uh, Byron might be able to to put it in the email follow up, or you can click get it from the presentation. But it's a link to uh, one of the chapters in my book that we made as an ebook and you can get it from our site at McDougal Interactive, uh, or you can send me an email, uh, jm at mcdougalinteractive.com, and uh, I'd be happy to take questions. So we're going to pass the uh, baton back over to Byron. Appreciate it, John. John. That, was, that was really, really awesome, awesome to see the fact that you have put into it put in into this, this, uh, uh, so that that presentation. presentation. Um, and, and am I being, am heard? being heard? Yeah, we can hear you. It's fuzzy again. It's, it's fuzzy. fuzzy. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, I go back to fun. Got it. I think my fuzz is going to go away in a second. <laughs> all right, You're I'm not fuzzy. fuzzy. Man. I'm a fuzzy. All right, I'm I'm good again. <laughs> um, my fuzz is gone, I, and it's also gone on the top of my head, I might uh, add as well. So I wanted to uh, uh, just show people a couple things. We have some really good questions, and I want you to start thinking about this one, John, while I show something. Uh, someone asks, um, you know, I work in a corporate marketing department. Uh, content marketing is demanding to us because it breaks down the traditional silos of advertising creative services, public relations, um, web, digital, etc. How do you suggest marketing departments organize themselves and their teams to build comprehensive content campaigns to get all of these traditional separate disciplines on the same page? So I'm going to answer that um, and then John, I want you to have a go at it yourself. So I personally think the answer to that question is uh, rooted in a content plan that begins to get all team members on the same page with what the goals and objectives are for content and how it relates to the different departments. 
So this is a, a, a campaign. That I wanted to have everyone have a uh, an actual content and SEO plan bundled together as an example. Um, you can see quickly the, the table of contents of really what we do here with, with a content plan. This is a, a pickup of a plan, an actual plan that we created for a customer that took, believe it or not, about 400 hours to create. So we're going in and we're, we're analyzing domain names and doing lots of interesting things and looking at, uh, you know, doing tons of keyword research. We actually used to use SpyFu to scrape uh, the organic keywords that were being driven to all of the competitive sites. Then we pulled out the duplicates. Then we pulled out keywords that we thought were irrelevant to the content marketing effort that we were putting, proposing in the plan. And it left us with about 5,000 keywords that we wanted to focus on for the content strategy for this particular customer. So, and then we broke all of those 5,000 keywords into about 15 or so different, you know, silos we call them. So we now sort of, uh, you know, within each silo, we had you know some golden keywords and some what we call low light, low hanging fruit keywords, which are listing positions in 11 through 50. Uh, so you know I won't spend a ton of time on this because you can all look at it, but I just wanted you to quickly hear from me what was going on as as everyone can download this. So we do all this research, right? We do competitive research to see, you know, where the, where this particular client stacks up with the competition, with page rank and pages indexed and inbound links and uh, you know all this data, right? Which then brings us to uh, you know a massive amount of data. Um, but then next, we need to look at auditing the content on their website and looking closely at what they're producing and we also want to produce some sample content so we can all get on the same page as I described um, of, of what what an example of quality content would look like um, and then we want to summarize everything and we want to say look we did all this research okay and this is what I think we need to produce we need to we're recommending 136 articles you can read the data here 890 blog posts, and this is just a one-year contract, 160 case studies, right? And this page alone, right here, most importantly, we, we re we're recommending a, f a half a million dollar budget, and we expect the traffic to increase um, a half a million, and the value for the number one listing position is to be 2.5 million. We're beginning to get very granular. We're showing budgets, who does what, you know, to answer that question of how do we get everyone on the same page. I actually presented a plan similar to this to a very large B2B company. Their entire marketing department sat and watched me talk about this plan, what we're proposing, what, what ROI we think we could get from it, and we, the goal was to get everyone on the same page for these particular assets. And you know that's really what people are doing. There's massive amounts of indexes that everyone will see here. Um, you know, so there's a ton of data that comes with, with, with our predictions and looking at how we're trying to help this company capture market share in all of these divisions that they're going after. So, you know, that's my answer, but John, feel free to chime in, you know, with, with, with your thoughts as well. It's a complex problem that in-house companies are having right now. Well, I think you nailed it with uh, saying that the, the plan is, is where to start there because, again, if you take a tactical approach, that's where it becomes just getting into the weeds and people start to sort of to fight on things. But um, if you step back and say, what are, the, what are the goals of the organization as a whole, you know, and make sure at the very high level you're clear on the 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 goals of the company, not just the goals of the market, you know, um, the individual parts of the marketing. And then maybe go back to what you said about uh, the Socratic approach with, um, you know, you know, sort of question-based selling, but maybe use that same tactic with each of the team members and say, you know, tell us what your goals are for the content marketing and get the list of the goals of each of the team members and then compare it to what the goals are of the company as a whole and make sure that everything is aligned. And if it is, then some of the things that the individual team members, uh, you know, if they're doing things that are aligned with the goals, then they should be listened to.
couldn't agree anymore, John. Let's um somebody has some other interesting questions here. I love this question. What the hell is ideation? <laughs> so, um, well, it basically ide ideation is nothing more than creating ideas. That's really the net of it. Um, it, it is a, a formal process, um, and, and and it's a buzzword I frankly love. I think ideation needs to become its own science, its own industry. Perhaps ideation is the next frontier beyond content marketing. Um, so, any any thoughts on ideation, John? How important is that to your agency? Um, no, I, I think I think you summed it up nicely, honestly. Yeah, let's look at a proposal. Um, so, you know, proposals are tricky little numbers, and um, you know, this is a proposal that everyone now has access to. This was back when Idea Launch was a full service content marketing agency. I made a conscious decision to move out of the agency business and move into the platform business. But I, uh, over the over the three or four years that we ran that business, I think we really kind of nailed how to pitch a customer and how to how proposals should be created. But honestly, this is like four years old, so I don't know if it's as hip and cool as what people in the audience are doing now as they're pitching projects. But a little summary of ourselves, you know, a, a crisp, clean statement of work. Uh, which understands exactly what we're trying to do, um, a summary of our services uh, that people can sort of you know get a feel for quickly, and we then go in with each proposal and we'll estimate the number of hours it would take to build out the content plan so that you just saw, um, looking at the different parts of it. We'd often have customers you know limit our budgets perhaps in planning and uh, limit our uh, you know a scope because maybe they had done the research themselves or they already had their keyword silos built out or they didn't need a website audit I mean they could customize this and, and we could do the same with them to try to you know see how much horsepower they needed up front um, but the planning we would sort of explain what what would be in the plan um, we would go through that process because that was a really a big deal for us to get that right uh, we'd also explain you know, we had little nice check boxes that people really liked on who's doing what. You know, Idea Launch is doing this, but the clients will get training, you know, or whatever. So, you know, it, it, I'm really was pretty happy with with this proposal, and people really got it. Um, the content we'd we'd often list what the, what the word counts would would be, and what level of writer we were going to use, and how complex the the work might be. Uh, so we were all on the same page, you know, articulating exactly what we're expecting. We didn't explain the different star levels of writers we might use, um, the, the, you know, the, the complexity, the project. Um, you know, so we're, we're trying to educate in this stage. I mean, much of these proposals were all about educating customers about content marketing. But I think in so doing, we were validating that we were truly experts, you know, in this topic and we understood what was about to happen. Um, so. You know, I just wanted everybody to see it. You can study it a little bit closer, but you know, John, how are you pitching jobs these days? You know, similar things to this? Or are you getting granular and you know, really diving in and customizing proposals? Or how's it working for you? Well, you know, we're we're not selling only content because we're a right. full service digital firm, so we're selling paid search as well. Um, although SEO and content marketing are at our core. Um, so we try and pitch, um, you know, the idea that the content, again, is going to make you more of an authority. You can then use, we can do public relations for you much more likely because you have a great blog. So we're really trying to come at that approach where it's content awesome on its own, but it's even better tied into multiple strategies. Um, but Byron, I, I would actually ask you, and, and we talked about this a little bit when we got together recently. Um, but I'm guessing that uh, out of the you know the people that are that are listening, um, not everyone is, uh, including myself, uh, pitching five hundred thousand dollar projects <laughs> to <laughs> you know for just content, right? I yeah. mean, we've got some some nice size projects, but. 500k for just a content project is, you know, you're you're pretty you're pretty far on the on the top of the, the food chain there, I think. So, what about for the smaller customer? Because you know we have customers from local mom and pop fishing stores to, you know, to big attorneys who, uh, you know, might have a lot of money, but they don't really sometimes even want to deal with content. Um, any words of inspiration for either the smaller customers or the 
banks and law firms that are really worried about compliance? You know, how do you get them over the hump of just even even getting them to blog once a week for some customers is hard. So any words at a lower level of how to kind of get them pumped up that, you know, that they're kind of missing the boat that their competitors are doing so much? Sure. The besides prayer, which which does work. <laughs> yeah, um, amen. It, it, um, you know, I, I think that really people are starting to get it now. You know, and I think that the, that what we enjoyed most about our job when we were doing it is is actually the education that we're offering and providing to customers in showing them examples of what works. That's I believe all people need to see, John. Right? Is you know, show me an example where you took a bank or you took a law firm and you went in and you and, and they, they trusted you to manage content for them and to not only manage content but in your case digital marketing, you know, pay per click, placement and you know, reviews and you know show examples of what you can get when you when you trust your agency, John, to, to with, 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 with some ammunition that you need to, to win some wars out there. And I think if you can show those examples to people, you'll be so quite surprised to see how quickly they jump on the bandwagon, honestly. And I agree with you. You know, you know, it's funny. I actually got out of the, the business in many reasons because, A, it was very expensive to go educate people and to pitch people on these big half a million dollar projects, right? Um, most of it was education, and, and most of it were very similar to the problems that someone chimed in with today, which is how our, our corporate, our, our marketing department is dysfunctional. Everyone's wanting to own certain pieces of the pie because they believe wholeheartedly in it, but no one wants to own the whole thing or get together to get creative people not just doing, you know, ad campaigns or traditional campaigns, but, you know, uh, images for blogs, you know, like that, you know, that's owned by another department maybe. So, you know, I'm a big believer in showing the results, getting everybody on the same page with the results. And one example of that is this new planner that we brought out to the to the masses here. You know, every one of our customers, you know, 7,000 of them, has a quick access to see how much content that I publish, both on my blog and in the social sphere, how much, how was my traffic affected, and how are my listing positions affected? We had some problems over here with this particular month in getting the data here because this is all a brand new technology we just rolled out. But it's pretty cool. It's like it's right in their face, you know. I mean, like, okay, I get it. If I drop my blog content, or if I don't, I'm not publishing a lot, then I, and you know, and I'm not gonna, my traffic's not gonna increase. So, you know, you can just show people monthly as you're pitching them these reports that publish no content, get no love, no, get no reward from Google. I mean, it's that simple. So, you know, I think that the, the proposals do need to back down a little bit. You know, when you're, when you're looking at $500 a month retainers, $1,000 a month retainers, you know, one of the things that, you know, you can't do a lot. You have to automate that if you're an agency. But I am convinced that, you know, by taking $500, you know, a month, banging out 15 blog posts, which at Writer Access costs, you know, what, 20 bucks a piece, 25 bucks a piece, you know, your clients will benefit from that. Because you'll be, you'll be going, bringing them from zero to sixty, publishing four blog posts a month. You know, I don't think you want to fight the battles with, with clients any longer of them publishing content. They need a professional, you know, agency, namely yours, or a platform if they can't afford an agency services to just bang out good content. So that's my thought. What, what's your take on that, John? And 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 how are you winning? Like you gave an example. You, you must hopefully you're going to win that client back that. Roll, roll the dice and fail, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think um, that your tool is great. And showing that when you back off, throttling off, like, uh, you know, like that client did where, you know, number one for saxophones for years. It, it was like a, over a decade ago, I, I had a little, little secret where I... Uh, I had a magazine that was producing content about band instruments. And this was so long ago that they didn't even think to put it on the web. So mm -hmm. I, I was trying so hard to get my client to develop content, I finally gave up and said, hey, the maker of this band instrument magazine that you gave me, do you, would, you, would you mind if I call them and see if the, the articles they do every month in their magazine we could put on your site? 
they said not only that, but we've got a backlog, and they like emailed me a zip file of like all kinds of articles, and I just wow. started posting them online with a credit them as the source, but Google, you know Google had never indexed it before, um, so I was able to get a lot of content. Uh, the other thing I noticed was that that customer, when I would go into the store every Thursday to get my check um, and talk to him, he'd be on the phone for like an hour while I was waiting for him, and he'd be grabbing a, two different saxophones, playing one versus the other, and mm -hmm. the guy was amazing on the phone, selling and talking, you know, educating the customer, and I said, I need you to give me stuff like that. So. You know, right. by videotaping him talking and podcasting with him, we were able to get a lot of great content. So uh, that that's another another angle of, of getting content. But even doing that, you still need a writer to kind of map out your your sort of table of contents and your strategies. Um, but back briefly to what you said about uh, showing examples, I think that's a really great point and. We've done pretty well with that, but we are making a greater emphasis on case studies than ever before and samples. Mm -hmm. And um, really just in the last months, I've never seen more requests for, oh, so you do podcasting and videos and blog posts, can, can you show me exact examples of you know, the content you created and how it's, in, in, you, know, you know, how you, can you show me where you're ranking for certain keywords? Um, so people are definitely asking us that, that, that of us a lot, and it's our responsibility to do a better job putting those case studies and video testimonials up on our site. So if you're going to sell bigger content, um, it's really hard to do if you don't have those samples. You know, one final question. It's been so much fun to chat with you here in the end as well. I wish we had another hour to talk, John, but and I really appreciate your time today. You know, you, you, you made an interesting decision from an agency perspective, and that was to hire the famous John Cass, who actually used to work at Ideal Launch That's right. when we were back in a full-service agency. Yeah, uh, so it's, exactly. And, you know, that's a big, that's kind of an interesting move, because John essentially is, is a content marketing guru, you know, and he, he's, he's taking upon this challenge of saying, we have to market ourselves better. We have to put content marketing, we have to practice what we preach a little bit better over here. Can you talk about that a little bit, or, or, or even John yeah. Cass talk about that? Yeah, Yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll intro uh, for John, and you know, John has worked for Byron, and uh, he's been the president of American Mar uh, Marketing Association uh, here in, in New England and Boston. Um, you know, and he's done some, some great things. He's written a book on, on corporate blogging. But the reason, part of the reason I brought John Cass in was, you know, SEO Moz dropped their name from SEO Moz to Moz because the world has changed. And, you know, I'm an old SEO guy. And, you know, I, I think the funny thing is SEO is far from dead. Google is still driven by keywords and, you know, but it, it, it has to be more than that, you know. It just can't be this flaky kind of, oh, title and meta tags, you know. A lot of the basic stuff, you still need it if you do it lightly and carefully and in a good, healthy way, but you can't just do that. So uh, what do you think, John Cass, in terms of coming in here and working with, uh, you know, the, the SEO team but trying to help us be even better at content marketing. Well, I, I thought there was a, a really good fit uh, between your uh, your philosophy and the company's philosophy and, and how I see the world as well, which is that holistic approach with um, uh, to our digital marketing, thinking about SEO, thinking about content marketing, thinking about PR. You know, I, I well remember a situation where I was in a, a room with um, a large client and it was their um, uh, magazine team who they also happen to have the SEO person there, but I was thinking, hey, why don't we have the PR team there as well? And we could be thinking about um, article pieces that also get published on the web uh, that we can then include um, uh, ideas from the SEO team for keywords, but we could also be thinking about what possible um, PR campaigns we could be running from those, uh, those articles. Or, um, getting sitting down with the PR team and saying what campaigns are you going to be doing over the next couple of months? What can we do as the content marketing team to help you out by producing content so that it makes the, your PR uh, campaigns much more uh, fruitful? Uh, I, I, th I think that's really the approach that companies have to uh, uh, take nowadays, which is have an integrated approach and, and really understand 
Um, also, you've got to optimize for those multiple channels and those multiple devices, as Byron mentioned earlier. A man of many ideas. It's all coming back to me now, John. <laughs> John Cass. <laughs> um, John and John, right? Yeah. Exactly. J and J. Um, we have someone, four Johns out of a dozen people, if you can believe it. Oh, oh that's funny. Um, we somebody asked a really good question, and I wanted to fire off an answer and see if, if anybody else as well, and then we'll, we'll we'll chime out today. But they said, when hiring a full time content person for in house, what what tips do you have to select the right candidates? Um, that's a great question, and I've thought deeply about that, um, and I have a couple quick cool answers for you. My, my, my favorite thing to do when hiring in general, I thought I'd shed some light, and this, this comes from a great book by uh, Jeff Smart and Randy Street called Who, um, and they believe in this sort of um, you know, quick screening process that you need to conduct with, with, with every prospect, you know, hire that you have. Well, first of all, they have a lot of cool philosophies. One, one is, you know, you always have to be hiring. Always be hiring. You know, it's like that is critical. Um, but their, their screening techniques are interesting. And that was, you know, the first one is, you know, what are your goals? The next one is, what are you really good at professionally? The next one is, what are you not good at? Um, and the next, and the final one is, who are the last five bosses you have, and how will they rate your performance on a scale of one to ten? And their contention is by asking these four questions, you can immediately peg whether that person is the right fit for what what you're looking for. Now, the final question I like, and I, we could go into that in details, but hopefully that helps. Hiring in-house content people is really, really tricky. Um, you know, content person. I don't really know what kind of content person you're you're talking about. For example, is it is it a writer? Is it a content strategist? You know, that's two very different people. Is it an editor? That's a third. Those are three completely different people with different skill sets that you need. So that's part of the challenge, and that's why it's hard to build a really good you know team these days because very few people have these particular skill sets. The, the fifth one that I love asking, though, with those, so the, the, you'll find the big four in the book, but the fifth one, which I think is the critical hiring question, is, is this concept of um, where do you want to be in five years, right? I think that an employer has an obligation to help someone get somewhere along the journey. Now, it, I'm not suggesting it, you're going to be here for five years, but where do you want to be? I think that you need to start now if you're trying to figure out where, you know, if you want to have a happy and fulfilling career somewhere. Where do you want to go? And you've got to start practicing and getting help from those people around you to acquire the skills to where you want to go. So there has to be alignment with those five questions. And I'm convinced now through my gajillion interviews I've done in my illustrious career that those in, within you know, 20, 30 minutes of asking those five questions, I can see if there's an alignment and there's a good fit without having to waste a lot of time, you know, going through multiple layers and having different people's opinions on things and all the normal things that larger corporations need to do. So food for thought. But anybody else have a final thought on that as we close out today's session, which focused on agencies? Well, just very briefly, um, hiring content people, is interesting from, from my perspective there's so much practical work that has to get done outside of the writing so just make sure that if you hire a great writer uh, they're going to be able to manage Basecamp or some kind of project tracking software and have project management skills because mm -hmm. what, what we tend to do is hire someone that's great in-house that can do keep get all the stuff done and then have very specialized niche writers get the writing itself done that's our, been our approach. Got it. Good stuff. Really enjoyed the presentation today, gentlemen, and thanks everyone, everyone for tuning in today. I hope this was really helpful. Um, by the way, this is the new content planner you're seeing in the background here. Super pumped about this. It shows you everything that you've produced or have uh, in production. Here's the idea. Oh, a writer had a really good question. I think it was one of the writers that, that we work with. They wanted to know, where do I see this new ideation tool um, that does the who, how, what? So I'll go in here and I'll do a search for a garden. Um, I'll click suggest topics and boom you can see how to build and raise garden you know search volume 4400 last month you know where is the garden of Eden how do I make a raised garden bed 
you know, this is a really cool tool to quickly find informational topic ideas uh, that's now built in and free for everyone. So a little trick for the writers on board, we don't have this tool available for writers. We really do need it though. I need to work on that. Uh, but if you can go, you can now go into Writer Access, get a free account in there, and you can actually click on Content Planner, and you'll actually come to the calendar right here where you'll be able to add the idea and then search for new ideas and pop in your keyword phrase. So I wanted to get that data to everybody in case they were interested. So uh, thanks again for tuning in. John, John, appreciate, appreciate you guys tuning in. Thank you, Byron, and everyone. Great presentation, everyone. You're gonna again. You're gonna get a link to uh, the decks and the recording of this presentation and uh, everything uh, following this webinar by tomorrow at the latest. But knowing Glenn, probably later today. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We'll see you for the 51st content marketing webinar next month. Thanks for tuning in.